Yeah, don't start saying anything interesting now. I've been working on some pagination stuff uh, recently because I'm making like a web page and need to show a table of lots of stuff. So like until now, I just create all the stuff and then I show it all on one, just one big long table. But uh, that's not so good. It's like slowing down like my web page because sometimes there's like a hundred things that come back from my server response. So uh, you want to do like some pagination stuff. Uh, pagination like actual data pagination or are you doing like virtualization? Like actual data, data pagination. Okay. Uh, so like I have like some HTTP endpoint, like slash users, right? And then I added the, we added the ability to like say like which offset? It's like out of like a total out of the total number, go like get, give me the next ten from twenty in. It's like this offset kind of pagination. Yeah. To get a different uh, kind of endpoint that tells you how many they are, or. Uh no, you just query the first page, and then it returns back like an object of two two keys. The first key is meta, and it tells you like how many total pages or any other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> meta information like that and then like the the data is the other key like the total total number of pages yeah so then like once you know the total total number of pages then on the client you can just kind of calculate how many total pages you should show to the user uh, so like given a page size of 10 and total number of items of like a hundred then that's like 10 pages you can kind of do that yeah so what you got what's your, what's your back end in uh, it's like pure script using the wrap, wrapping express. Oh, okay, cool. Mm -hmm. And then what did you do front end with? Um, the front end is a pux. I have not used that yet. Mm -hmm. Is it okay? Is is that the one that's similar to React, isn't it? Um, it it's it, it uh, uses React to render the views. Okay. So um, do, you, do you end up using the same sort of? Bits and pieces, or is it entirely different? Bits and pieces you, of what? You don't get. Do you get things like initial state or whatever React uses, stuff like that? Uh, there's no initial state. It's like the you, you just start with one state and yeah. uh, you just trigger actions to like actions to change that state. So it's like okay. Oh, sorry, maybe like I a meant single Redux store, maybe. No, I meant like the life cycles. You know? Oh, okay. Yeah, there's no life cycle stuff. No. Oh, okay. That's Talking cool. about Pux, right? Sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it's like just L architecture and you you can even opt into the smolder render now. So there's like there's really nothing you get for actually interopting with React. So it's kind of just an implementation detail that you even render to React. Uh, cool. Yeah, one big frustration uh, that I've seen with Pux is trying to reuse React components in Pux. Um, so like if it's a simple React component, like yeah, like simple, then it's pretty easy to just kind of import it and use it. But uh, we were trying to use uh, like React table, and it like wants to manage multiple, like like you you, you pass in uh, React components into properties of that thing, and then it, like uh, the header element and like what, like what, like what you want each cell to look like, and e like each row, and then it manages putting those together into like one big table. Um, but yeah, so like we try to like just import that one like a simple React component, and it just uh, it was awful, <laughs> like awful, it's like trying to debug why it wasn't working. So like we wanted to have like a button in one of the cells for like I want to edit this row, I want to delete this row, and any action, any pucks action that's triggered from that cell. Like it's just gone. It doesn't go anywhere. 
and it, yeah. that's kind of because Pucks does behind the scenes. It does like this event propagation, um, some parent action and child action. It, it's really hard, really hard to understand, and there's no docs about why it does like that. I'm also on like a previous version of Pucks, but it's not a big deal, I think. Yeah. Um, that appears to be a common thing. Uh, I'm also on a previous version of Pucks, and I was listening to a previous meetup where someone was also on a previous version of Pucks. Oh, yeah. So wh why are you on the previous version of Pucks? Well, I can't, because the view, uh, like if you want to make React, or if you want to say like div, attributes, and children, if you want to say that, like you, you, it's completely different. Like the newest version of Pucks uses a smaller thing. Yes. So if I want to rewrite my app from this old version of Pux and the new one, like I have to like change almost everything. Yes. Yeah. I that, think like I've that, that's what it seems like. Thing. So I just haven't attempted it. Yeah. I think I've decided to go to Halogen instead of if I have to rewrite the app anyway. Well, I mean, I, I think Pux is okay for um, like doing small parts of your like if you have yeah. a big app, then you can do like a small Pux app in one of them. Like treat a Pux. Thing is just one React element. Yeah, and you can just use PureScript React um, to do the whole like your big your big app and use Pucks for just like the really intense like user intensive areas. All right. I'm curious about trying that. Yeah. Well, the longer you leave it, the worse it gets. I'm converting it. Mm hmm. I've just stepped into well, maybe. Yeah. Well, I've I've just stepped into a project that's React. And it's uh, it's kind of using React from five years ago. <laughs> Fuck, man! <laughs> I just look at it going, "Whoa, I've not seen so many bind this in my life." Isn't React pretty good for backwards compatibility? Uh, to a certain extent, yeah. But it's just like the architecture of how you do things now is like way different. So, like, we got like a really cool Haskell backend, and then we got like a crazy five-year-old react front end because clearly the the haskell was written because the person enjoys writing haskell and then they're like oh fuck the front end i'm just gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna keep adding shit to this <laughs> just like not caring <laughs> it's great <laughs> yeah yeah no it's definitely succeeded you, you gain loads of stuff after this is on like things because it went to 6C, but then it was before it was 0.14, wasn't it? And then it changed to whole numbers after that. Yeah, so uh, I'm just looking at it going, ah, oh, I wish I could change it, but the app's so big. So that's <laughs> the, the point of this bead is the longer you leave it, the worse it gets. <laughs> it seems to me like uh, like large frameworks like this, like React and even Ang Angular, is way worse than React even, right? Like yeah, yeah. going from version to version, they're very bad at keeping backwards compatibility. Like mm. we started off at the point where Angular two was nowhere near being ready, and React was quite new. And we we said, okay, let's pick the like currently mature solution, which was Angular one. And oh boy, <laughs> we're not st stuck with like 30k lines of like JavaScript type. Well, it's actually TypeScript, thankfully, but it's still, even even though we made it in TypeScript at, from Angular 1, it's still impossible to migrate to Angular, like whatever, 5 or whatever is the new oh, version. Yeah. It's like we're massive we're just going to rewrite it in PureScript or like bits, like small bits and stuff like that. It's, it's way too much work, not worth it. Uh, so did you approach it by doing bits at a time or did you just... I mean, we barely did one pure script POC app just to make sure that we can do it and it, we can integrate it with the current. Because, for example, I cannot move everything. Like, we, we have the Angular uh, router that we use, and I, <laughs> I cannot just jump to using a pure script router, right? And, like, sure. make all, all of the 30K lines of Angular code to work with that. So it's much easier to do it the opposite way and allow uh, the current Angular app to still be the drive in the driver's seat. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so that's kind of like what I'm trying to sort of sell is yeah. maybe try and plug some little bits in. So um, I've actually, for work, I've been porting pretty much our Angular code to PureScript and Halogen, and it's so far working out pretty nicely. Although my team doesn't really like it for non-coding reasons. I don't know what it is. Anyway, um, <laughs> I can tell you is it works really well. Like. Like basically, I have have a Halogen app sitting inside like an Angular controller, 
that yeah. renders its own view, and that works pretty well. And sort of unmounting the controller is a little odd because you have to create like a future and then tell Halogen to like render to an empty element, which supposedly that's what it does to stop processing. That part's a little magical. Right? There's no like, hey, Halogen, stop. <laughs> like, can't do that. Um, so, but so far, my experience has been it's very nice. I actually, if I'm not mistaken, it was you who gave me some advice a couple of months ago. I think so. I, I actually pretty much have the same thing there, right? Yeah. A controller that loads the Halogen app and it's it's working out pretty well. Like we're very happy to with the like small proof of concept app and we're moving on to build more apps and nice. I don't know what to do with the existing code base if we are going to get to actually rewriting everything, but if it if if we're gonna have to do big changes, I'll probably go to yes, but otherwise we'll just keep both for now. Yeah, uh, yeah, sure. Uh let's see. I think John wanted to uh, uh he has uh, overview of the change log at the PeerScript ecosystem. Uh, I, th I think that's something that uh, is worth uh, just talking about every time that we meet up for this meetup. Okay. All right. There's not a whole lot of changes, but I mean, relatively, I guess. There's plenty of changes <laughs> that happened. Um, here are the packet set stuff. Uh, since last time, these were sort of, here's the overview. Uh, thank you, Justin, for adding Sparkle and fixing the Sparkle issue. Hooray. Um, <laughs> um, so this is some of the stuff that's there. Um, let's see. Moving on, some doc updates that were there, minor. Um, <laughs> um, just basically some basically documentation. Um, I, this is kind of just good to have in general. I feel like maybe we should see more and more of these, hopefully, in the future, where we're like, hey, here's some more examples we added for these libraries. Like, that'd be nice. Because like, even look at the PureScript contrib stuff, I think there's um, like the Argonaut JSON stuff, and it's not very documented. Like, it's like, oh, here's all these functions. Good luck. Uh, enjoy. <laughs> so um, there's like a PR with an open doc in there, but it hasn't been merged for God, I don't know why, but we could use that in the community. Like, it would be good for us. Oh, uh, by the way, Justin, the type level prelude thing, that got snuck in there because of Spork, I believe. Um, so it's part of the change in that same uh, PR that was merged in. So FYI. Um, some library updates in and around the ecosystem. Um, just, you can take, just take a read at this. Um, Small stuff, but useful stuff, I think. Uh, PeerScript record got an update. I think that was also thanks to Justin. So now you can modify a field in a record. I don't know if I'm using the right terminology, but like. Yeah, it's a modify for builder. So now you can compose your builders with modify. Mm. The normal modify still works. Or rather, you can use a record update syntax for it. Right. I thought that was kind of neat to see. There's actually a test in there which shows that. So hooray. <laughs> Um, yeah, the foldable traversable stuff, the index L, index R, I thought was pretty interesting. Just very generic, but interesting. Like, I'm not sure when I'd use it, but it's interesting nonetheless. Anyway, that's that, library updates. Uh, compiler updates, this completely screwed up. Um, <laughs> here, let's just close all that. I will reshare my window. And oh, there's this one down here. That's why. I don't mind. So, yeah, the compiler updates are down here, basically. Um, I thought that was kind of neat that um, there's some error scan information added in there. So, like, if you encounter some of these errors, at least these three defined ones. Uh, the PR for the type class related one didn't exactly say which errors it was um, talking about. Basically, this will, if there are errors, that data should be reflected in like the, I believe it's like JSON output, if basically for communicating with the language server, I think. So if you have those types of errors, you should be able to via the tooling to go directly to them inside your editor. Otherwise, it, previously didn't have some of that line number, I think. 
I'm not entirely clear on that, but basically there's better information for errors. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I can definitely say that, for example, shadow name is something that I was like, well, okay, where is this? And you look through a huge file and you have no idea. It doesn't, I think it says the name. But yeah, it, it says the name, but not where it is. And if you use it multiple times, then it's going to be very hard to find. So that's yeah. nice. Yeah, yeah, especially when you go between files, because then you, it tell you like multiple files to go through. It'd either be the very top one and the very bottom one, but then you'd get the the route that it's taken. So you'd just be like, it shadowed somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I I love seeing improvements for more specific points about where the error occurred. Um, yeah. Like like I can live with it as is because usually it's just I I change like. 10 lines of code. So if I change 10 lines of code and I save my file and there's an error, I kind of have an idea about where to look for the error. But it's, right. I, I always appreciate seeing more specific. Yeah. Um, the REPL updates I haven't been able to try. Um, but I guess it because of this line over here, um, basically all transitive symbols are now available for completion. So now all the re-exported ones are there as well. So if you import a module and that module is re-export some other modules, all those re-exported ones should now be uh, auto-completable in the REPL. So that's pretty neat. Um, I don't know who added the error span info. I haven't written that down. I just go through all the PRs and be like, oh, this one was merged in the last like two weeks or a month, and it's kind of about it. <laughs> yeah. It would be nice, but I don't know. Sorry. All right. Well, that's pretty much it. So there's that. Thanks, John. Yep. No worries. Yeah, it's always really nice to see the uh, progress that's been happening in the uh, community. <laughs> even even if it's just a little bit, it's pretty motivational to uh, see things keep chugging along. Um, yeah, and I wanted to show because um, I talked in, I talked uh, just a few minutes ago about, uh, my, about the pagination problem that I was working on, and I was really curious about how uh, how I can make that more like pagination more type safe. <laughs> so I spent a good chunk of time exploring different options for uh, making my code more type safe, like the pagination part. Um, so. I, I, I kind of put together a little presentation here. Uh, how do I even play this thing? Is there a play button? Here it is. Okay. Um, yeah. So, like, I start. I started out with just the. Uh, um, very simplest way that I th I'd like to do pagination. Um, so like, yeah, here's the kind of problem, like the situation uh, in which I want to do pagination. So like in my Pucks app, um, if I do an on-click uh, handler, then I want to change my page from you know, current page to plus one or minus one. But if I do that, then I have to know what the, what the, what the last page is so I don't go over that, um, for example. And this kind of immediately brought to mind uh, this, the nature of bounded enum. Um, so if you're not familiar with bounded enum, um, it's... Uh, I wonder if I can bring it up in the, my browser. Oh, come back. Go down. I'll find it on pursuit. Okay, so bounded enum. I like to. Okay, so bounded enum uh, um, implies that you have the bounded in enum instances, and an enum is a type that has. X number of elements. Um, and that sounds like pagination, right? Like if you have 10 pages, then you have 10 elements in that. Um, and the members of that enum type class is like the successor or the predecessor to whatever your current uh, item is. So if, if uh, I think an example of 
uh, data type that has an enum instance would be uh, the calendar months, January, February, March, April, May, June, July. Um, so if, if, like, if you ask for the successor of July, it will give you uh, maybe August. Um, because if you're on December and you ask for the successor of that, um, then there's nothing after December. I mean, you could roll back to January, but that's kind of out of the definition of enum. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so that's enum. Um, and then enum uh, requires you to have an ord instance too. Um, bounded is the other part of this bounded enum, and this implies that there's a top and a bottom value to your uh, type. So the top value of this month data type could be December, for example, and the bottom value would be January. Um, right. So, and that kind of maps directly to pagination too. If you want to go to the last page, then you do ask for the top page. If you want to go to the first page, you ask for the bottom page. So uh, I was really like thinking, boy, this sounds perfect for pagination. I wonder how I can get this into um, my code to make this work. Um, so I tried. Um, yeah, so that's uh, all the definition of what a bounded enum looks like. Uh, right, so here's my first attempt, is say, uh, have a data type, I just call it page, uh, for no good reason here, and then it has a current page, and the total number of pages, which I call count. So, with this data type, if I ask for the next page, if, like, given the current page, I ask for the next page of that, it just gives me, like, current plus one. Um, Right, so presuming that this is a good definition for a page, then we can go ahead and define the instances required for bounded enum, which would be the enum and the bounded. And then after that, I think we get bounded enum. Uh, yeah, then we need to define that. So let's, let's start trying to define an instance of enum for a page. Uh, so if we, here's the type signature for the suck function. So given, given one of these pages, uh, return the, the page after that. And that's pretty straightforward. Um, we can return a nothing value if the next page is out of, like, out of bounds. If the next page is greater than count, then that's out of bounds and we can return nothing. Uh, otherwise, uh, we're going to just add one to the current page and make a new page with that. Uh, and in that case, we don't change the total number of pages, the count, that just stays the same. I'm going to do a similar thing for pred. Oh, and by the way, uh, most of the code I pasted in here can be considered to be pseudocode. <laughs> You're letting type check it exactly. Um, but I do have most of this code in my in a GitHub repo. Um, there's a link to it at the end of this. I'll post it in the chat later. Um, but yeah, most of this should be working, but it's not perfect. Um, and also, this is just my first uh, round for this page type. I'll show you later. Uh, a better definition of this. So that, that, that's the enum instance. Um, pretty straightforward. So then if we try and define the bounded instance, uh, what would that look like? So for the bounded instance, we have to satisfy this member of top value of a page. And so how do we construct the top value of a page? Um, the, we have to give the, we, 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 have, we have to know, like, I don't know how to do this because like, what value do we choose? We, we can't just ask for the top int, because that's not, it's outside the definition of our, our, our paging system. Uh, what, we, what we want is to know, yeah, like, we, we just want to get this last page from somewhere and use that for both, both of these. So, what do we do here? Um, so then from here, like, I discovered that if we can put the total page count in the type, like in the type level of this page definition, then we can just like take that page value and use that as the max, the last page number. Um, so here's what my first attempt at doing that looked like. Um, so we just changed the count from just an int to uh, this type, and, and we put the type parameter over here. So now it's a page uh, of a certain number of pages. 
So it's like page one of 10. Um, and then like, this is my first example. And then after playing with this data type for a while, I discovered, well, we don't even need to have count in the value level here because uh, it's in the type level here. And every time that I want to, I will want to use the total page count, I, I always just get, get it from the type level. I mean, so this just, the, the, the value level count just becomes unnecessary. So if you look at my GitHub repo, I just change it so that the type level uh, count, it, it looks like this bottom one here. You can use page int or page natural if you want to preempt negative numbers from your paging system. Um, yeah, so you have a page count. Yeah, uh, I'll send it, going back to implementing a bounded instance for this data type, uh, now count, that type is available in the type here. So when we want to use that to calculate our last page, we can just uh, reflect from the type level to the value level, uh, which is a similar strategy to what's used for type level strings. Um, I think there's a reflect sim, S-Y-M, function that's used to reflect a uh, type level string to the value level. I, th I think that might be used for error messages or lots, lots of different places, yeah. Um, but yeah, so we can use a similar idea here. If we say uh, this is supposed to be a simple net on the count, uh, a constraint on the count type, uh, type area level here, I'll change that. And, uh, but yeah, so then, yeah, uh, like any questions on this? I mean, it's seems pretty straightforward to me. Yeah, I like your usage of the, the bounded enum thing. Like that makes a lot of sense to me, where it's like you have a well-defined boundary, basically, like mm -hmm. the beginning and the end of the pagination, you kind of just move it within it. I like that. And my, I had a little um, pagination piece of code in that some of the Angular stuff I ported over, but I didn't even bother. I was just like, uh, I have a list. I'm blanking the chunks. I'm storing those chunks, and <laughs> I'm just going to find the index. Uh, but I like this way. This is uh, a nicer way of doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'll show later like how this, like I haven't decided whether this is like a great solution for my pagination problems, um, just because it seems a, a little more verbose, like a, a little more complicated than it needs to be. And when it actually comes to using this, um, it's a little, it's not, I don't know, like I'm not, I'm not quite sure about this. Like I think this idea needs to be played with a little bit more to make it something that you would actually want to use in a uh, web application. Um, right, so then once we have the bounded instance and an enum instance for this type level page count, then we can do the bounded enum instance. And for the bounded enum, there's three members, cardinality, uh, two enum in front of, from enum. Uh, so the cardinality is the total size of the type. Like how many elements are there in the type? So that's a pretty easy answer if, because that's already in the type, this count variable. So we can just reflect that from the type level to the value level and then just convert that from the natural number. Like, because in my implementation, I said that this type is a natural number, but uh, you can change it to be whatever you want. You can say it's a positive number or just a type level of integer. Uh, but yeah, in my case, I just want it to be natural. So then anyways, uh, once we reflect it from the type to the value level, then we just convert it to an int because the definition of a cardinality says it has to return a, a integer. Or at least the def like this type definition of cardinality. Right, and then the two enum says given some integer, um, because a bounded enum is like X number of things, like given a number, then we can create that number of um, yeah, that page. So given, if, if given the, the number three, we can create uh, an instance of page where the current value is three. So it, it's, it's, I think that's pretty simple. Um, and for every, any int, we're not sure if there's a page for that because you might give us an int of 100 uh, for a page of like, where it's only 10 pages, but um, given a certain number of pages, then we can certainly get the current page out of that. Um, I wonder if this is worth explaining here. So to enum, um, we, we make a page where the current value, 
for the current page is uh, um, to int, so we take the i nat. Yeah. Anyways, the, like the, I, I'm not one to like go over details too much. <laughs> like I'll do, I'll do the details when I'm type checking the code. But if you guys are interested, you can uh, check this out a little bit later. Um, so then let's try using this to see like what the ergonomics of it is. Um, so if we want to make uh, a paging system where there's three pages. We want the current page to be page number two. Uh, natural number is start at zero. So we want natural uh, number two to represent there being three pages. Um, yeah, so then we make uh, nat two uh, to represent the page count of three. And if we want to define the current page to be page number two, and then we start from like this integer one, and we just do the two enum from the bounded enum instance to get uh, uh, an instance of page. And then once we have that page instance, then we can uh, just like start asking for the next page, next page, next page, previous page. And we can see what happens once we go over the end. Uh, so page two of three, if we uh, ask the successor once, then we'll get page three of three, as you can see down here. Um, if we ask for the successor again, then we've passed the bounds, and, and then we'll get a nothing. Um, and then one of the reasons I kind of, let me go back to my browser here. One of the reasons I kind of like uh, bounded, bounded enum is because there's a helper function you can define that just gets rid of that maybe. So given that A is uh, bounded in, in, in value, you can safely ask the successor um, without, without like you can get rid of that, you can discharge that maybe pretty easily. And what happens if you're on the last page and you ask for, ask for the next page of that, it will kind of default to uh, being a no op. So I, kind of, I think this is like the coolest like function ever. Um, right. So when I show you here that, uh, that there's this just and nothing going on, we can instead, we, we can relatively easily discharge this just and nothing stuff by using that helper, that helper function I showed you earlier. Um, yeah, so this is pretty easy. Like, it's pretty good. But um, there's one limitation, is that you have to know the size, the total number of pages, at compile time. <laughs> and in my use, I want to query some database table from my browser, and then it returns back the first 20 items, and it tells me how many total they are. So it says, here's the first 20 of 1,000. Um, so in that situation, I don't, like at compile time, I don't know how many pages there are. So it's like, how, are we, how am I supposed to make an instance of page if I don't know how many pages there are? And this one, this is pretty interesting actually. Um, this is like, I think that this, the answer to this question is like, was what makes this topic really interesting. Uh, because this is, uh, in order to do this, it, re it involves kind of like an existential, uh, uh, existential variable, because like there's quantifiers in Haskell from what I've seen. Like you can say for all a this function works, and then you, in certain cases you can you say there exists some a where you can do this. PureScript doesn't have that exists keyword, but um, uh, you can still do a similar thing. Um, it's worth finding. Uh, so reify sim. This one. Yeah, so this is how um, existential quantification looks like in PureScript. Uh, so given a string, we can make a type level string. That's what sproxy is. We can make a type level string. Um, given that you immediately consume it and turn it into something else within the context of this thing. Um, and like, you think that that's like, when, when I first saw this, I'm like, okay, that's kind of weird. 
And then when I started playing with it, I'm like, wait a second. So I can't actually store this S proxy sim anywhere. Like I can't make, make this S proxy sim and like put it somewhere in my apps state. Like I couldn't find a way to do it because when I try to do it, it uh, the compiler complains about uh, some escaped scolum. <laughs> I'm like, oh good, I like that error. It's quite fun to hear about some scolum that's escaping. But I mean, it doesn't help my, my situation. Um, right. Let's see. Because right down here, like, what is the concrete type? If I, if I say, like, here's page two, make me a page instance uh, for that, it's like, what NAT count do I put here um, at compile time? Like, you can't just put a wildcard here because at compile time, the compiler still needs to figure it out. Um, right, so you can't, like, you, I mean, you, you, have to, you have to use this existential system. Um, and the reason that this existential system works is because I was talking with a monoid musician on uh, the chat room, and he explained it uh, pretty well to me, is that we, uh, we can get the exact... Uh, semantics of existential quantification just by having this higher ranked uh, argument. What is it called? Is this, what is this called? Higher kind of high, higher ranked polymorphism, maybe. Yeah, this where the the argument can choose uh, the type. Here. But yeah, by, by by putting this in the first position, then it kind of like in a contravariant position, then it hides away the value in, in a certain way such that it works. So if you're ever reading pure script code and you see this kind of pattern where there's a function that returns an R and then when that's all run, it returns that same value. Like if you see this kind of pattern, you might be looking at existential uh, uh, quantification. And there's also a pure script exists library. Which gives you a type constructor for doing a similar thing. Uh, and I asked like, for this rayify sim, why doesn't it use this? And uh, I, if I recall correctly, I think the answer was that uh, in that S, in the S, in that rayify sim, it uses an S proxy uh, of something, and like this exists, it it only works for uh, it doesn't work for higher kind of types. That that might be the answer. Um, I didn't dig too deep into that, but excuse me. So that exists also. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I think that was really interesting. I wanted to bring that up to you guys. Like, I don't know, do you guys want to talk about that anymore before I kind of go on about existential quantification? I'm trying to think, what's the kind of a, the kind of a S proxy isn't tight, right? So maybe that's why it doesn't work with the pure script exists. Yeah, not, yeah. Not, not, not I, I think I think that was the uh, that was the answer I got was that okay. this is a different kind than type to type uh, type again. Okay. Yeah, I'm just trying to make it make sense of it in my head. So. Mm hmm. It's kind of mind bending. Right, so a wild existential type has appeared. <laughs> um, right, so now I want to show like how we can use this runtime type, like the run, like at runtime we'll know the total number of pages. So and how can we, how can we take the total number of pages and put that into the type level for our calculations? Um, uh, yeah, so like I said, if we want to do reify sim, we can do uh, similar for type level NATs. We can reify a natural number. Uh, so we pass that runtime number here, um, and then we have to consume it immediately. So I'm using these two different consume functions. This is just to put a um, better user interface into uh, this. So for this page A's, uh, given a, like a set of A's, 
and the t like how big one page is, how many elements are in one page, and what current page we're at, then we can construct a page type. Uh, the rayify and nat function itself, it, like if we just use this, if we don't wrap this, then in this consumption function, we will have we will we will, we won't see the page type. We'll just see like proxy count, and like if we want to consume a page, like that's not what we want. So it's kind of it's kind of useful to like write, write this wrapper function around here. Um, right. Um, uh, nothing else interesting here. Like here's where that uh, transformation happens. Like the like we go from that proxy, the type level NAT, into that page type that we want to work with. Um, yeah. So then let's let's look at how we would use this page A's in like a real app. So then given uh, so this is like the kind of interface that you can use it like at runtime, like given a, a, an array of users uh, and how big a page is and the current page we're at, um, then we can ask for the next page and get a simple int back. Um, and what that looks like is we use this existential, uh, this uh, reifying system to, uh, to do that. We'll use that page A's before the, the users uh, and then we can calculate like what page we're at given the current page size. Um, and then we have to consume it right away. And then in our consumption function here, uh, we go from page, we, we, I mean, we, we have to go from page count and we have to reduce that down to something else. And we can do that pretty simply here because given the, like, in, like the purpose of this function is to make a page and get the next page. So we can do that by uh, taking that page and asking if the successor, and then hand handling the maybe case. We could use that SUCC prime function, uh, but just for simplicity here, I decide not to do that. Yeah, and then we can uh, just get the next page. And then, so th yeah, that's, but <laughs> like having done all that, it seems like a lot of kind of, De it's, it's pretty deep. You gotta, you gotta go down the rabbit hole pretty deep to like understand how this function works, right? You have to understand the relationship between type level and value level variables and uh, you, have to, you have to like in import into your app, you have to import uh, uh, type level natural number definition. <laughs> uh, it gets a pretty deep rabbit hole. And if we look, at, I mean we could re-implement this exact same signature without using this you know, type safety uh, by just like doing this simple calculation like right in place. Like if a desired next page is greater than how many pages there are, then just keep you on the current page. Like, yeah, I mean, the, the behavior could be exactly the same as this type safe version. And I'm just like, I'm not exactly sure like, is this actually more type safe? <laughs> like, is what we gained by doing all this type trickery and type fun, is it better? Like, I'm not sure. Like, do you guys have any answers here? <laughs> no, I mean, I'd be really curious to find out, like, from somebody who knows this a lot better than I do, at least. Because, like, for example, for me, of course, when you have a simple function, like, a string to bool that's an evidence that you can take any string to a bool right so, well that, that's probably a bad example but whatever right whereas here you go through this and again i'm not at all familiar or very uh yeah not very familiar with existential types so, so i'm not sure how this translates into actual if you want to quote unquote proofs like is this a real proof that you cannot go over uh the total page or is it just some like compiler tricks to to get you there but it's it's it, there is some, like if you write a problem like a you, you miss some sort of like uh, instead of greater you do less than do you get a do you get a compiler bug or do you get a runtime bug that's the main question i guess well yeah yeah you mentioned something interesting there in that it, like this this more complicated one is that a better proof <laughs> and that that makes you think back to the idea of you know Types as propositions. It's like, is a pro like the type level is like some proposition, and then the value level is the proof that that proposition is true. And 
both of these type check. So, <laughs> I mean, both are proofs. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, but the, the, the moment you bring values to the type level, like you did with naturals here, for example, then that's what, that's how in my, in my mind, at least that's when you try to bring the proof to the type level instead of keeping it at the value level. Right. And for some functions that is true, right. For example, if you, uh, maybe that was a bad example there, but for example, if you have, let's take a better example, bool to string, right? That's like, you can always take a bool to string. We know that, right? That's a safe function. It's a pure function. You don't get any, you, you, I mean, normally, unless like very weird happen, weird things happen to the runtime, you can never ha have anything else than true and false coming out of that. And it's like, you know that. Uh, whereas here, I mean, the question is when you use the pages function, right? That's the, that's the main thing. Is it, type level proof that you cannot uh, go past the last page or is it uh, value level proof? That's, that's the main question. Because of course, at least we always want to have the type level proof, right? Because that's stronger. That's where the compiler gives you a, an error when you do something wrong. Whereas a value level error, you, you get a runtime error, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because I don't understand the existential theory, I, I, I have no idea whether <laughs> it's a compiler trick or it's actually, or it actually is a proof. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you got me. If, if, if this is a better way of doing it than not, I don't have an answer for that. My guess is you're probably going to find different people saying different things. About <laughs> like, I yeah, and be, be, because this code is going to a browser app, yeah. I'd, I'd like to make the amount of code as small as possible. Yeah. <laughs> for It's always a good thing for user experiences. Don't make me wait forever to load your web page. So. Yeah, yeah, no, that, 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 yeah, that's totally fair. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I got a few other slides here too. Um, so that was like my first like venture into improving the type safety of a pagination. Um, and then something else I tried. Well, I wasn't quite sure if like this is a good idea or not. This is just like one slide. Um, was to couple together the pager and the data collection as paging. And I also tried to play it with. Uh, because before I, where is that? I made the, I made the, I moved the total count, total number pages into the type level, like here at the bottom. And then I also tried to move the total page, like a single page's size, how many items are a page? I tried to move that to the type level too. So that if you want to like <laughs> compare to two of these size pages, then you're like you can do that because they're like the same 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 number of pages, uh, same page size. Like maybe that's even better. I'm not sure. But like this is another type. Another yeah, you could do more here. Um, and so then, given that like size page thing, then we can couple that with uh, some collection, like a list or an array of something. And like here's like how you do that. You just use a tuple, I think. Um, right, but. This makes it makes the, like the previous limitation where you have to know at compile time the page size and the page count. Um, that that's becomes an even worse problem if you're going to use this type. Um, right. Right. So like I kind of I played with this a little bit. I kind of dropped it pretty quickly, and then Joe uh, uh, Joe Kashmar I think. Uh, as his name goes, he, he gave me this post like, oh, you're doing paginators? Have, have you seen this uh, paginator blog from a while ago? I'm like, no. He's like, oh yeah, pa paginators are melee machines. I'm like, oh, interesting. Well, I guess that makes sense because my understanding of a melee machine is it's a thing and it, um, it's like accepts a command or rejects a command. Um, I think it can also conditionally hold some state um, and it has some output. So like, I, I kind of played with the idea, kind of impl like most implemented, 
uh, a mainly machine pager for pagination. Um, and so there's actions like initializing it. I'm not sure this initialization thing is necessary, but like to a, like you'd, you'd have a page with two actions. Like you'd send a next command to it and a previous command. And if you send the next command, then it would do some calculations and return out like something. And in, in this attempt, I, I, I made it uh, uh, like fetch the next page of items from the server and return that next page of items. So in, in the Melee machine I made, like it uh, kept in its state. Uh, um, what did I, I think I had it keep in state uh, page or this pa this page one. Right, but like you, if, you, if you're curious about using a Melee machine to make a pager, I made a really complicated one. <laughs> so if you wanna play more with like the Melee machine idea, you'd probably best start from here. Uh, I recommend trimming off my monad because I made my monad be a state and a continuation so that I can have this melee machine like actually do the fetching for me and come back with it. Um, but then I got, like, I, I can't figure out transformer stacks. Like I couldn't figure out how to run this transformer stack. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not, like, I thought, I thought transformer stacks are fun idea until like it comes time for me to run them and I can't figure it out. <laughs> So, yeah, the integration part's always slightly, it, it escapes me right now, truthfully, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but this, uh, this looks pretty promising for certain use cases, for, for certain needs of a paginator. So, yeah, this is worth playing with. Yeah, so in conclusion, I didn't use any of these ideas. I just went straight for the simplest one, which was just manually checking, is the current page bigger than the max count? And I just did that, like, manually encode. But it's, this is a great learning lesson for existentials, um, use, like using values between type and value level. Um, learn about how you can do melee machines. You learn about whether you actually need to store uh, that state in like a state T, or if you have to store, if you have to couple like one thing with the data. Like I found that just to be more complicated. Um, and best just to get that state from elsewhere when you're gonna do the next page's calculation. That's, that's what I ended up with. Because I wanna store like the current page like in the URL. So when it comes time to ask for the next page, I'll just fetch the URL, like I'll fetch that from elsewhere and then do the calculation. This kind of stuff. So yeah, that, that's all I've got. I mean, if we wanna continue talking about this, uh, it'd be fun. That's yes, really nice. Thank you for the presentation. It was really interesting. The uh, existential spot, I, that, that was very, very nice. I'm going to read more about that, but it was a very good use case. So it's going to probably help me when I read about it, think of this example. So thank <laughs> you. Oh, good. I'm glad it was useful. Thank you. And the Millie Machines example is also very nice. That's cool. I'm going to keep this repo in mind. Mm hmm. Hmm. So unless you guys want to bring up some other topics, like that, that's all that was on the, <laughs> the list. I was wondering, has anyone ever tried doing stuff like, uh, I don't know, PhoneGap or Cordova or whatever you, with your script or, or anything other to that extent, like uh, doing native apps basically? Yeah, I mean, there's like various ex existing approaches to React Native. I guess there's been like five prominent-ish ones, and then Dual says it's like the newest or most updated. I think the problem is just that people do React Native at work, and they don't really want to do it at home. Like, I don't know. I've made money doing React Native, but I don't like it. <laughs> I mean, that's why I have the uh, web audio thing where I use Halogen, and then even though the whole progressive web app thing is like a total pain in the ass, I still do it instead of trying to put together React Native. But I think nowadays, like if you use some kind of approach like React Basic, you could get like a pretty workable setup without too much hassle. 
but yeah, to just need someone who's like actually dedicated and actually likes React Native. Not plenty of them out. <laughs> what did, were you curious about Cordova or React uh, Native? I mean, uh, any way to like bring some like pure script app to to mob as to a mobile app, right? And I was sort of hoping it wouldn't. But I guess that's where every uh, most people are doing it, right? We're using React Native. I kind of don't really like that app <laughs> so much. So I was like, I was thinking, would there be a way to do it with using like whatever you like, whatever app you do in PureScript? Like you have an HTML and a throw it there inside. I don't know. But then I guess it wouldn't be very optimized, right? That's the whole trick. But if you just throw it some HTML and JavaScript, that's not uh, native or whatever platform that's. Uh, uh, optimize specifically for that, then you're just gonna get like a app in browser kind of thing where maybe it's a bit too slower, doesn't feel like a native app, right? No, and then React Native comes. Well, I've I've made some app as well before in it, and it comes with loads of like native specific functions. You know, things that you can sort of uh, aim aim at. You know, like sort of simple things like sliding screens and things like that. You get loads of different little quirks so that's why people it's not that bad for converting you know when you go because you end up you, you can use all the state and all that stuff the same as you have it but then you just have to sort of remember so that's why a lot of people use it because they can convert whatever app they've got online and then they can simply port it across well not simply but easily you know easier than say making it out of something totally new but yeah i know it's still react isn't it so it wasn't too bad though. I found it okay, as okay as it can get, I guess. But I just found a, a really good boilerplate. And I was like, oh, that's how you make it cool. I'm just going to copy that and then <laughs> just put in all my fit and bits and then it worked really great. But yeah, to start from scratch was probably horrible. But it did use, what was it? Is it like Mob? It was about a year ago. This is it like Mob X, I think there's another one. Yeah, that was horrible. But yeah, I don't know. I've, does, what's the repo? Because someone else was asking about this. There is someone who's done something already. Um, but no, I don't think there's too much experimentation, is there? So it's, it's not a high level of joy unless, like, Justin said, you're working on it and being forced to do it, I guess. No, uh, it's, it's not. That, that's, that's a problem. I, I want to do something for fun and, like, help a friend with, like, some app, but then I don't really want to do React. Like, if I could do it in PureScript and Halogen, then I'd get some fun out of it as well, but... Uh, if I have to do React, then I'm not sure about that. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I don't know because technically, it you know because React is only going to take HTML. I guess you'd you'd have to mix them. There'd be no sort of way around it. I don't think you'd, you know, just for the code to actually, or maybe you could sort of pass to React Native the compiled. Uh, <laughs> the compiled pure script code <laughs> and hope the React Native can read it. Yeah, it doesn't sound like fun to me. Yeah, I mean, if you wrote your logical stuff in pure script, you could just write all the views in JavaScript and then use like parcel and whatever to bundle it all up and build it. But yeah, just. I, I, I wonder why your friend wants. Uh, a mobile app, um, because for most of the stuff that, like me personally, I would need, like I like a web page is easier for me to make and deploy. Um, yeah, so I'm curious why you want why he wants the mobile app, just so you can have uh, something in the app store. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I didn't even go into that yet. I was just thinking, hey, can I just do what he asked without questioning too that too much? Uh, yeah, of course, I I'm gonna try to challenge that at some point, but. If I end up helping him, but yeah, I'm just curious. Like, forget the specific example. Just hey, is there a way we can do that in pure script? And it seems like yeah, it's pretty much. And actually, it's not even pure script, right? Even without considering pure script, even if you just do JavaScript, it's still uh, React Native or stuff like that. So. But yeah, actually, Justin, that, that's a good idea. Like, if you really, like, it's just a matter of, hey, you can do just the thin UI layer in React Native and then have all the logic ex exposed to script and then 
called from JavaScript or whatever. That might make it bearable. <laughs> I mean, technically, what is it? Halogen's UI type is not tied to the HTML. So you can possibly hack around and swap some other type via some FFI and reach into native. But then you have like the opposite problem that like everybody else does. Like typically most people have all their logic in like Java or Objective-C or Swift or whatever it is. And then they interface into the JavaScript web engine to render the UI. But in this case, you all your logic would be living in JavaScript, then you'd reach out into native to draw all those things, which is an interesting thing, I think. But yeah, that's interesting, actually. Hmm. Has anybody been, uh, been able to understand what uh, Phil was working on? He was working on uh, the Smash thing, uh, extensible co-effects is his description of it. Like I'm, I, and and then he was working on something else, uh, uh, code transformers or something. Yeah, I, I'm just mostly curious if that's like uh, another way of doing extensible effects, like extensible co effects. Is that how does that compare to extensible effects? I mean, <laughs> if you open the repo and look at the first couple of like the literally first three words followed by. Science I don't really understand. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're gonna need somebody like Phil here, <laughs> or at least one musician or something. Uh, yeah, I do not understand deconvolution. I know a little bit of math, but okay. I'm not there yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's on my to read list, but I'm definitely not there either. So. I was just curious, um, has anyone done any drag and drop related code in JavaScript? Yeah, my name was a musician made one for Halogen. Mm -hmm. Oh, did he? Okay. Is it called uh, Halogen? Called Zuri Zuri, I think. Zuri Zuri, that's the one, yeah. What? Halogen Zuri Zuri? <laughs> that's the Justin naming. It's oh, a great name. Yeah. No, Justin. I'm going to be a dragon. You have to be influential to the community somehow. Inspiring people to give great names is. Uh, is yeah, like how am I going to find that? Jeez. <laughs> yeah, I linked it. <laughs> there should be some keywords on the GitHub repo. Uh, Hello. Once again, I showed up at the end of the meetup. Uh, what did I miss? Hey, Rob. Besides everything. <laughs> Sorry. I just figured I'd drop in since I'm now finally working up. How's things? Um, I was I was talking about pagination for a while. That was pretty interesting. Okay, cool. Yeah, and now now we're just uh, talk, uh, trying to find a different topic to talk about. Talking about uh, PureScript on mobile. If there's any good solutions for that. Okay, cool. What have you been working on, Rob? PureScript stuff. Uh, I've been running sed on multi gigabyte data files. Um, I'm kind of looking for a new job. I haven't, I haven't written any Haskell for the last couple of months or anything Haskell shaped. Um, oh. so <laughs> it's, it's all gone a bit weird. Um, uh, yeah, no, no, it's just like a interviewing five companies at once is, a, is taking up all my time. <laughs> um, so, but, uh, yeah, I'm kind of curious with the mobile. I, particularly, I'm curious if everyone's done PureScript uh, React Native as a thing. Uh, as in, if everyone's oh, the same way, PureScript React. We're just native. talking about that. Oh no! Oh, uh, I think we're oh, mostly yeah. talking about avoiding doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's that Reaper out there. If you've seen it, uh, it's just PureScript React Native. So I think that, I think nobody in this room is experienced with it. No, but it. it, it I mean. I've just linked and repaper it, but it doesn't look too bad. Uh, where is it? Oop. That's not the one I want. Mm, 
There it goes. But yeah, I would do the, uh, I think there's yeah. like a, a create React Native starter kit. I think that's, you gotta start from that because I think the build system is pretty essential for making React Native stuff. So you gotta start from like the JavaScript side, start from like where everybody has tread that path. And then just make a few components using PureScript and pull them into your JavaScript driven app. I think that's the direction I would start from. I guess it'd be pretty feasible. trying to figure out what what build stuff this doesn't do because the AI is telling you hey just call the react native thing i don't know if that's doing effectively the build stuff you're, you're talking about or i mean obviously you need to turn to an app to it is the entire like take it from something to ios or to android i'm just trying to figure out what's it's got this react native cli thing mentioned in the readme and then a run a run android and a, um, a run ios i think God, I know nothing about this, so it's, it's a little hard to figure out what's, what the missing pieces are, if anything. Have fun. <laughs> I've I've been living in the, I've been in the same situation. I I had to go for uh, job hunting recently. That was good fun. Um, but yeah, I've I've gone the other way. I've gone from pure script and I've. Obviously, there's not many pure script jobs out there, so but I managed to somehow land a Haskell one. Um, yeah, and then fr from working in pure script because I, I started in pure script and now I've kind of gone with Haskell because obviously there's no other pure script jobs, but yeah, there's a few things I definitely miss from pure script that uh Haskell doesn't really have, and things that are kind of like from playing around. I've only been doing it for like a week or two, but yeah, there's some nice things with with Haskell. But like a, yeah, straight away. PSE idea you had, it's like, fuck. When you're in Haskell, Christ, that thing's useful, I'm telling you. I'm not gonna tell Christoph now, but yeah, it's well good. <laughs> just uh it just typed holes like decent they, I know they're sort of updating it in Haskell and it's gonna be a bit better. But like when you use typed holes in, in pure script, it's like yeah, it, it, the recommendations it gives you is really handy. You can just like really play around with it. And then, yeah, anything sort of PSE ID related is uh, is really useful. I, I did like, I know I kind of like had asked just mundane things that like deriving stuff. And I know the reason for, for PureScript to do that is to sort of have readable JavaScript, um, you know, content of what the PureScript compiles. But I kind of question like who actually reads the JavaScript that's compiled. Like most people just put it straight into Babel or I don't know. I mean, I I don't know. It's kind of it's not something in the world. I mean, you know, if you if you've got a derived show, you've got a derived show, and you've got you, you can do it manually, and it, it gives you that flexibility, I guess. But it'd just be nice to have both because it's just like in in Haskell you can just go drive, 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 and <laughs> be really lazy, just do it all. But yeah. So yeah, so Haskell, so I can get more lost now. It's great. But then the the the, the bad side of it is I've got a great Haskell backend, and I've got the I was explaining at the beginning the the world's most weird React front end. It's like a really I don't know. It's like a weird implementation. I don't even think it's React. <laughs> uh, I showed <laughs> Justin. I, I showed Justin some of the code, and there's a lot of lolling going on. So yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> Legacy code is fun, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's unfortunate. I mean, you know, it's like I'm sure it, it's like any project. It starts off and it means well, and it's it's up to to date, you know. But to, <laughs> to, to keep that going and then to sort of it, you know, if because unfortunately that that they're not a massive team, so to then you know it's a big project to then try and keep that up to date and and change as, as things move forward because what you're doing you're going to make sort of um you know big design ideas or choices architecturally of what's going to happen 
and then sort of five six months later it's like well no you don't want to be doing steak like this there's way easier ways to handle steak why don't you try it like this and you know and then it's like fuck i've just spent like six months <laughs> right this way it's like should i change like you know like that crossroad that you're at it's like oh well i could go to the newest pucks but it means i've got to change all this 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 and this and it's just like and then you'll find it. it's like well it's not worth moving and then like a version later be like oh my god it does all this great stuff and now i'm fucking this far back behind and i can't move all the way forwards so it's kind of like what's happened to the project it's just totally understandable but it's uh, yeah it sucks <laughs> it's like you come in and you're like damn it why have you done that <laughs> but yeah it's cool man i just that's what i was questioning about you know what what if people would just put small chunks in there you know like the pure script chunks but then i'm just kind of thinking oh it's just going to add more you know to the compilation so then when you're, you're compiling a code you've got to do the react then the pure script then the haskell back end it's just going to be like yeah it's going to i think that'd make it worse than it begun with i don't know yeah it'd be good because i know the guy loves haskell so he'd be keen on it but yeah we need a bigger team just you can't just transfer stuff over like that <laughs> but it does bite you you realize that like from using um you know halogen for that for quite a while that they because they, it's just pure javascript yeah it bites them man They're like seriously like at the minute i spotted like a weird bug where things just keep rendering six times <laughs> like for no for no reason just things just keep rendering so like you won't see it it won't happen but we if you put a, a log somewhere you, it'll just come up six times and it's like what why is that rendering six times and just things happening you know because there's no type system it just goes yeah it's, it, it it wasn't apparent until i went back to doing some react i was like whoa fuck like it's quite actually useful oh i just thought of something i like it seems like everyone here uses webpack to uh, bundle there. Well, uh, most people that I talk to, it's like Webpack or Rollup, um, or Parcel now, I guess. <laughs> yeah, um, Justin showed me that. That looked really good. But I'm curious about how to load PureScript code from the server, like what, like in, in the browser. So if I write some PureScript code, and it's only one module, just the main module, and then I put that in the browser, and like that one module's dependencies are all in the browser. And then, I, like on click, I want to load a different pure script module, like from the browser. Like so, then I have to like convert that. Like I have to take that pure script module name and then send it. Set like request it from the server. Like that. that so then that there must be some file on the server called like like dot slash output slash uh, pure script foreign slash uh, index.js. And like I just want to load that JavaScript file. Uh, from like from the browser and it seems like uh, like the next version of like there, there's some proposal for a, the, like ECMAScript 6 or something 7 for native modules right such that there's a DOM thing where you can say uh, please Im please import this JavaScript module and then like it'll just asynchronously get that module from you for you from the server and there's some spec for this and uh, there, there's an early implementation of that spec called System.js. Um, so I'm I, I, something I'm going to be doing in the next week or two is trying to see if that's possible. So I just send up like just the main like you know compile main dot purse in the main dot js, and then just send that one up to the browser. And then as dependencies are needed, um, like it'll load up that next module. Um, so you know, like it'll load up like eventually like it'll like send ton, like yeah I'm curious about this kind of stuff mm -hmm. I, I'm, and like webpack is really kind of depressing in this aspect because it gives you no tools for configuring how to load modules from the server from like from the browser like from from the server into the browser like lazily lazy load these things it has this it can do it but it's very it manages manages it all for you. It's like its own like invisible, like they call it like a runtime system, but like everyone else in the JavaScript ecosystem, like is calling this stuff like a module loader. <laughs> it's like the, the browser can do lazy module, um, lazy module loading. Um, right, but like Webpack it has like no, no answer for this stuff. So that, that's why I'm gonna be trying like the system.js stuff. So I'm curious if anybody else here has tried like system.js or 
other other ways besides Webpack for lazy loading modules. So is this like the offshoot of trying to do server side rendering then? Um. Yeah. Well. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of like that service. <laughs> I, I have to figure this out first, and then. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, because I did warn you about server side rendering. <laughs> oh, it's a deep rabbit hole. It's, it's, it's doable. But, I mean, the well. alternative is just use Webpack and don't think about it. Like that's the alternative. I mean, yeah. you, you like I, I need to understand how this stuff works. I don't know. I mean, Justin, I, I don't want to see that parcel JS link again. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. He just links me to the. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you yeah I mean, if you have static things, then it's code splitting. But if you have dynamic things, then it's like you got to roll your own solution. Yeah. yeah. Have fun. No, definitely. I don't know. I've In the past, I've worked with a server-side rendered JS app. And to be honest, I don't know. It, it, see, it, was, it, it was cool and stuff, but I felt it was built more because it was cool rather than its usefulness. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but in then, the long run, it, the the dev time spent trying to make sure that everything you built was both had the ability to be rendered on the front end and the back end turned out to be. You know, you spent way more time trying to figure that out. Oh, uh, but this is just because you're using JavaScript. I'm sure, my good sir. If, <laughs> if, if we can implement a good system of uh, PureScript, yeah, I think yeah. you might like it again. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm definitely. If you can do it, I'll be really happy. <laughs> I, I I wouldn't want to be you. <laughs> but then, like this, uh, uh, this new like ES six way of module loading, it depends on the target JavaScript module to be in a specific format. It has to like use like the new ES six style of um, requesting, like importing and exporting stuff. And so, if, so if, if we want to do that for PureScript stuff, we have to re like we have to like compile PureScript to output as like ES six modules. And okay. there, there's an issue in the PureScript repository about this. And oh, yeah. well, we had it's just lots of back and forth. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, well, everybody supports uh, ES3. And yeah, well, yeah, yeah. but like, you don't want to, um, like, all, no, all the browsers now support ES5. And you don't, like, it's just less code if you just use the newer syntax. And like, it's a lot, lots of back and forth conversation. Yeah. But I'm, I'm curious if, if we can get that started again. Mm, yeah, I think ultimately it came down to they wanted to sort of have support for older browsers, but then realistically, the way everyone does that is they just use Babel. You know, that that's kind of the answer to that. But and also it was the other pro to doing it was having you know the ability because obviously it uses a different import. You know, your modules and everything like that. How it imports on ES6 meant that you could use tools like um, Roundup and stuff uh, and Webpack to do better. Um, dead code elimination, things like that. But it basically, I mean, I don't know, no one's against it because it's just creating a different back end. That's basically what you've got to do. And then output it to give an output of ES6 rather than ES5. And I don't. So just a compiler flag to like yeah, what, I guess what your so. code gen is going to be? Yeah, I guess so. Because I don't think it's like a massive jump. You know, you're just going to have to sort of change a few things to functions and uh but yeah i'm not gonna do it <laughs> i kind of was like yeah this would be really good and i was an advocate for trying to change it but you know you can you can advocate but you've got to sort of put the work in really so you just got to stay with what it is for now the, the problem with the problem with the they're not really even any six modules there they're still figuring it out they're still figuring out how the module system and the module loader system is meant to work mm -hmm. and particularly how things that aren't using modules and things that are using modules and how they interact and how browsers do it and how node does it and whether we that they force uh, do something via package json or split it into a different .mjs file there are still active flame wars about this stuff where people are furiously <laughs> typing at each other 100 words per minute and it's just turned into recreational typing instead of coming to some sort of freaking yeah. solution I, I, so I really i would love to go down, like, down, down that route but i fear just doing the oh suddenly the semantics of the world have changed and mm. we've got very little like you know the, we, ha we have sort of few people involved with actually sort of doing this work and javascript is shit ton so they'll figure it out somehow and we'll be like well we're trailing and then we went the wrong direction and now we're trailing further <laughs> so it's like oh christ i always feel like i, I want to wait for this entire thing to settle down before you even consider it 
but people like using modules as if it was already a figure out thing that's hunky dory and it's going to be perfect in the future or something. I have no idea what the fuck to do if you've part my language. Suggestions <laughs> welcome. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Justin, yeah. can you jump in here and be snarky about something? <laughs> yeah, just say TypeScript. TypeScript's great. Justin? I mean, like, yeah, just like Rob was saying, like, ES6 modules are total hell, and people flame more about this. Even people who love JS, and, um, yeah, even, like, TypeScript 2.7 now is going to, like, finally give up its, like, absolute stance and allow you to import to import the common JS modules, the ES6 module de defaults. So, yeah, it's, there's just no good solution. There is one solution. So you, you, you think if I want to compile peer script in, and uh, have the result be ES6 modules, I'll just have to make a kind of a post processor. So peer script continues to compile into require like common JS. And then I'll have to apply a tr like transform to that to compile it from common JS into some newer format. Is that is that going to be like the only way forward for like the next several months? Do you think? Yeah, and as far as I know, people actually do do that in JavaScript land, so it's not like so far fetched. What? Yeah, as far as I know, some people are are today taking like the module exports equal thing. Or like exports equals and like object thing, like they're like processing that to figure it out, like processing the ASP and then moving huge chunks into a bunch of like the uh, ESX module format exports. I don't know who wrote the tool, but I read about it somewhere. And then, well, my my only reaction was to say that's crazy and then close the tab. <laughs> And then you said it's not the name's not good enough, and then you close the tab. What was it called? Do you remember? I've oh, seen a few no. JavaScript libraries. Like I can't remember the name. I think one was called Steel.js. S T E A L. I'm not sure if they're doing if they do that transformation, but it it's in that ballpark. Great, another tool to the pipeline. Whoop. Yeah. And then I'm, every time I add a new tool, I'm worried about, am I going to lose my Webpack HMR? <laughs> sure hope not. I need my HMR. Surely that is soon enough, Webpack's going to be like a job title, isn't it? Like Webpack developer. Because it's almost like its own language, isn't it? Setting up a Webpack. I mean, just about every job listing for front-end stuff I've seen in the last, like, two years has Webpack in it, so. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. basically, like, configuring Webpack is a full-time job now. <laughs> yeah, just on its own. <laughs> so, I've always gone to places for some reason. Oh, even at, even at the Slam Data, that was my first thing. Right, I'm going to uh, configure the Webpack stuff. <laughs> Dude, and like, it's... Everyone had just left it on purpose because they, like, they were like, we're not doing this. Fuck Webpack. Does anybody <laughs> use Webpack for uh, like managing stuff other than JavaScript? Because like whenever I want to bundle, in, I just want to do JavaScript bundling. But like one of the big sells for Web or Webpack is like you can require a CSS file. <laughs> yeah, it turns into total hell though. I mean, I've used it. I've used the asset loading stuff for like almost four years now, and it's it's never been a good idea on any project. Like people love it because they're like, oh, I can just require and then I put into sources and they're like, it'll figure out the base 64 whatever thing to inline the image, however. But like, it's bad for caching, it's bad for serving it out, it's bad for your own development. It's like, it's never good. <laughs> but, sorry. And then I also like really hate Webpack loaders because like, there's a lot of ways where you can't actually do streaming builds and notify like upstream. I don't know if they're like changing that with like Webpack 4 and whatever, but it's been like the case for a long time. So even like the PERS bundler, PERS loader is like, it just takes the most naive approach by default. And that's like, honestly, the most reliable. And then there is like some kind of PSE ID mode that is prone to breakage, but it tries to do the right thing where it tries to let PureScript compile the common JS output and tries to like use those. 
but yeah, uh, speaking on this, I guess like I could link my glorious parcel JS setup where there's like almost nothing going on at the Bible uh, file as usual, and then you can look at the package.json and you see parcel index.html, and then it just all works. Like, I don't know. It's not like you get away from Webpack Hill. It's just that Webpack Hill is mostly taken care of and made performant for you. So with parcel.js, you have to have a .html as an entry point? No, no, no. You can use like just a normal .js file, and then like if you change stuff, it'll like rebuilding and everything. Okay, okay. Cuz I um, yeah, did you see my tweet about the thing called asset graph? It's it looks super cool. <laughs> uh it's I mean it sounds like uh it starts at like the html file. Like I, I think it only works with static websites though. Like javascript to some degree, but it I think it's primed to start from like some html file and then do all like make a dependency graph. So like here's an html file, here's a css, the css JavaScript, JavaScript that's required by that, and then like from and then I'll go to there and find all their dependencies. Like it's it makes the entire asset graph, and then once you have that entire asset graph, you can apply transforms to it, such that uh, you know you can bund like bundle your JavaScript or you can uh, uh, like make a sprite of all your images. So if you have like twenty images on one page, you can like bundle those into one just one image, and then like edit, edit the nodes in your HTML page so that they refer to the right position in the sprite, sprite sheet. So this asset grab looks pretty cool. I mean, it, it, yeah, I mean, it's, it sounds like that's what Webpack should be. It's just like the dependency tracker. And then like you can apply some simple transforms. And, and like to some degree, that's what Webpack is. But I don't know, pretty crappy UI. Yeah, and I mean, also that sprite sheet thing can turn into a total trap where it's like you put it all together and then you realize like every time you change one small image, like everything has to shift and you have to update like literally all the assets. I mean, it doesn't really matter for like most web Western websites and applications, but it can be a pain like if someone's browser is messed up and like tries to over cache everything. Which has been the case with like some of my projects that had to target like I ten and stuff before. I completely decided. Has anyone used brunch before? Like Curiosity? That's what only the with the Elixir stuff, yeah. Right, okay, as I was say, it's what the Elixir people seem to um, recommend in terms of, well, rather, sorry, uh, seem to use particularly with the, well, there's a, a bunch of, you know, Elm plus Elixir um, bunch of examples. I was just trying to figure out, I was trying to dig into it to figure out how it differs from what it does comparison to say Webpack or Parcel or what have you. Um, Yeah, I think as far as I know, it's like some kind of glorified framing for um, what's it called, uh, like grunt and stuff. But yeah, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, just trying to figure out in advance how um, what a pure script on a an Elixir app would look like in terms of loading. Um, I'd be tempted to. Sorry, cat bum in the camera. Um, <laughs> That's what they do. Um, don't worry. Yeah, yeah, I know. Um, I just say, uh, yeah, trying to figure out what. Uh, yeah, I was going. So I was looking at the Elm integration, how they tend to be done. Um, but I might just sort of start from zero and have a look at uh, say what a, a parcel plus uh, Elixir thing would look like. Um, it's all the yeah. Expert. Last time I looked at Brunch, it didn't handle. Common JS modules, and I thought that was like absolutely bizarre. But maybe by now it's different. So if you can handle Common yeah. JS, you can handle PureScript. But yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, okay. Elm doesn't output ES star. I'm gonna call it. Cool. <laughs> it's not ES six modules anymore, mate. Um, it's yeah. Uh, I mean, with Elm, it's like uh, you have to like just load it in and use the global, I guess, usually. Yeah. 
like the so whole I guess I guess brunch must then support something that's not even common JS kind of thing. If I have, if my understanding of how Elm Elm's compile output works, I haven't honestly haven't manually looked at and the Elm compile output for it in a long time. But yeah, you're mostly looking at like Phoenix apps, right? Sorry, say again. Mostly looking at Phoenix, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, as a as a framework, a Phoenix app and maybe some manual stuff on the side. And so it's throwing messages at each other or whatever. But yeah, the wave app stuff is definitely Phoenix. I think I've asked this before, but no one's using pure Earl in anger, are they? <laughs> Not even the author, for better or worse, unfortunately. Uh, thanks for the link, Justin. Yeah, no problem. Uh, I did this forever ago, and like this was the only thing I wrote in Elixir, so yeah. Oh yeah, the React basic stuff. I think it's like pretty cool that like uh, uses existing libraries for how like the React component stuff is typed and like, how to do it. So it, like has some JS for doing the code gen and generates like literally like everything. And then it works by uh, having a union between um, like the subtype that you pr provide in and then the actual like type of all possible props and then like by doing that it actually does the type checking. It's like quite nice. Like you instantly know if like your property name even exists at all. And then you know like if the type actually matches. And then so it's like not at all like your other things where you build a list of like random commands and you like kinda hope for the best ish. Like it's not like truly error prone, but like you don't have like duplicate um Duplicates where like you're trying to like set the same property twice or something. Sorry, uh, what are you talking about, Justin? Uh, React Basic, like how it does the props. Was that Phil's thing that he made for Lumi? Yeah. Um, should I share my screen? Let's see. Yeah, sure. That'd be kind of cool to see. Can you see my um, Chrome? Yeah. Yeah. And you. So the nice thing is. Um, <laughs> Let's see, let me just pull up my actual thing. So I did a little demo thing with like audio. It's like kind of normal. Um, this course F to React FX thing is because the FX and React Basic are closed to React FX. Like Phil said that he just wants to convert just to effect whenever he can. So it's not like it really matters. What, what um, is React FX? Uh, it's like this data type of kind effect. He just uses it for like set state. Because you know it's like it's an effect that shouldn't escape React. So that's why like set state and like these uh event handlers down here, these are um a closed row of React FX. But that's just like a detail that's like gonna go away. But um yeah I made this thing where it's like you have a just a view with like standard things with React. So it's like text and then if a file input and it has an on-change uh, thing that I used to handle like what file was selected and a little audio thing. So like these like autoplay source and controls things, these are um, all like uh, actually in the props that you work with um, from React. And um, it's all uh, code to work with this uh, whole union thing. So, um, so it probably makes more sense if I like bring up um, the thing. Let's see, what's it? Uh, did I have generate docs here? Yeah, cool. Generate docs and index. All right, so let me find red basic real fast and then find the types. And then you'll see that, like, because this is uh, generated, um, oh, it's not actually in here. Where is it? Basic. 
Dom the internal Dom. Oh yeah, look at this. So this shared props is like defined in a React package about like what all prop types that can be in React stuff. So you know, like about except char set blah 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 blah. And so like these are all like typed and available for you to use. And the like all the like stuff is like generated and whatnot. So the way this works is you provide a a record of the subset of uh, fields that you care about, of the properties that you care about, and you like build it up, and you pass it in, and it just uses this union and says, okay, like do these two like things actually like, come together, and do they make any sense in this like total props and thing? So that's I, just row types. Yeah, um, I think row types allow you to make duplicate properties. Uh, but records, no, right? The records won't, right? So that's why it works. Yeah, this uh, attributes that you're passing in some kind of, some trash that some trash uh, sub row that like unifies with this to combine or like these are like I guess all the complementary fields that like you haven't defined out of this total set. And then to share props is like parameterized so that this props a like all the props that are specific to A, like come in here. So these are like all possible props. These are props that you actually uh, supply, and then these are the props that you haven't defined in your record. So this is like much like cooler than like say how we have Halogen today, where in Halogen you just make this array of properties and you just like hope that you didn't put in duplicates. And then this actually like type checks quite readily and easily, whereas in Halogen, it's kind of like you get the command, but it's like, uh, I don't know, it's, it's a little bit of a pain in that you have to look up what the command that you want is, and then like the, the type error, I think the position information is gonna be right and everything, but it's just not as convenient as just a normal row unification error. If that makes any sense. But yeah, I just wanted to show this because it's like it's fun, it's relatively new. And uh, you just use this Babel to do this um, normal Babel config, so just React Native config. I have this index.js where I um, bring in my thing, and I, it's because it's React 16, I like stop create class like this and then bring in my common JS module and just use it. This, is, this part is like just normal JS and this is like the hot reload whatever crap. And uh, yeah, the index HTML where like parcel reads it's in, it's just an empty div, I mean one, one div that's for the app and then like pulls in the source file. So like when you run this locally, it just, it just works. And uh, what else? Yeah, package.json, whenever I do start, it just does parcel index HTML. It works. Yeah. And I made a tweet about this earlier where I talked about how, um, uh, where did I put this? Yeah. So it's like um, if I do the ID server stuff, like whenever I have it open or running a plugin and I change stuff, like less than 100 milliseconds, it recompiles the common JS modules in output. And because of the index.js having the require in from the output, it uh, parcel rebuilds it. And it takes like 20 to 30, I mean 20 to 50 milliseconds. And it's like right there. So it's fun. It's like typical hot reloading stuff that you'd expect. Do you, do you have to reload your web browser page in order to pick up the updated? Yeah. It just does hot reloading, so it like oh, so Parcel will inject some in. sort of thing in the browser to yeah it listen for updates web, sent from the server. Code. Yeah. Does that use an existing project, or do they kind of roll their own thing for doing that? I think they use a whole bunch of like stuff that um, Webpack uses. I forget, but it's like stuff like like the um, alternative React people. 
did, I don't know, as, as much as that can even be a thing. <laughs> but yeah, just not doing any Webpack stuff is like pretty fun. And I pretty much only use Parcel at home now. And then I only use Webpack at work, where it continues to be a massive pain. Uh, who's, who made Parcel? Like, do they have like corporate sponsorship, that project? Um, it's like some Adobe guy and then like mostly like James Kyle of React fame. Okay. Yeah, I think it's like mostly this Devon Govet person, I think. And he's like Adobe, whatever. Uh -huh. and James Kyle did like a lot of the like, uh, like more finished touching up work and stuff and then like telling people about how to use them or whatever. Yeah, it's like 18K stars. So you know it's a real JavaScript <laughs> project. You know, it's hit, you, know, you know it's hit the front page of Hacker News. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's popular for a reason though because like Webpack is just so damn hard to use. And then mm -hmm. this thing is like... But is, it, is this thing works. configurable? I mean, does it have nice like plugin points or, or like nice nice... Is that use standard things? Like I don't know. Like like it's I, like you see the thing with Webpack is it's it's a known quantity. <laughs> no, Webpack is always dark corners. Like no matter what you do. Well, you know which we know where those are though. So to stay no. away from them. I I seriously don't know. And I've and then Webpack they, like they have like money. so much money every month from their whatever their funding platform is. No, it's like they inspire they, they, they inspire confidence. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, everything works. And all that glorious asset, whatever stuff is in here too. But I plan on never using it. Oh, there's a React recipe or whatever. Didn't know. Recipes. Yeah, but yeah, that's, that's it for me. And I don't think I wrote anything new in the last week. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for showing that that React Basic stuff. Yeah, I mean, I just think it's cool and it's like quite usable. So, like, so you can like if I if I use PureScript React um, and PureScript React Basic, I can kind of use those together in one project pretty well. Um, the types will be different, but you might be able to use them quite quite well together. But it's also like, um. I think you can basically get away with only using React Basic. Mm. And then Phil was talking about how he wants to add like the lifecycle method stuff later. But you could probably add those yourself in a fork sometime. OK. Like main, main useful thing is that it actually it just uses the normal row type mechanisms to do the uh, property unification or property type checking. So it's like super nice. And I kind of wish that like we could use that with all of our other libraries too. What, more, more row types? Yeah, for like all the properties and attributes, like there's like no reason why we shouldn't. Yeah, there's a PureScript options library that's uh, been around for a while, but it's a little frustrating. I mean, we have more constraint checking now on rows. So yeah, I kind of agree with you. Yeah, I actually have never used this options library. Does it give you like the, a good way to work with uh, sub, subtypes? No, not really. Actually, I'm just going to control F union. It's not in here. Yeah, maybe this is older than the union stuff. I guess union stuff mostly came out like last summer or something, like around like when like row cons and stuff came in. I mean, it's it's like kind of weird thinking about it. It's like pure script is like so completely different from even just one year ago. Mm -hmm. Oh, I just want to make the observation that. Uh the JavaScript ecosystem, people complain about, you know, UI framework fatigue. There's so many UI framework coming out all the time. Like, I don't like it. But now, like, if we look at PureScript, I mean, it's kind of the same. 
<laughs> I know that there's that Pure Script Specular one, and then there's the Just Pay people. They make their own thing, and then there's just the Vanilla Pure Script React, and there's Pux, the just and there's Polygen, <laughs> React Basic now, <laughs> uh, Incremental UI, the frickin' <laughs> Thermite. There's all sorts of different things. Uh, flame walls, Twitter account. Uh, good uses for applicatives, uh, like yeah, validation. Um, Fusecript fetch uses applicative. It's like depends yeah, on it heavily. So like anything that does like parallel operations, you basically want to have applicative, and you kind of don't want monad ever. So like the pair af probably uses applicative. Yeah, I think so. Or, and there's even like a parallel library that like exposes some like helpers for doing all that kind of stuff. You know, like, uh, um, I think it's a type class maybe. There's also something about like uh, applicative parsing that might be interesting. I haven't looked into it, but just this idea that like you don't have to do like a bunch of crap in sequential order. This is where, like for example, um, where Optipass applicative, for example, uh, is an example. Is an example. Of this both from the just just because it's doing. I mean, it's it's a parser. It's a plenty, but it's also taking advantage of the fact that it's structure preserving, as it were. Uh, as in, you can the same way like free monads. Like you can't really do anything without sort of basically going and interpreting. Or effectively, to plug anything out of it without basically interpreting the thing. Free applicative gives you because it's you're getting effectively the same structure back. You still have something you can look into. Um, in all pass applicatives uses its applicative structure to then give you to uh, to do things like error messages and to do things like presenting options and flags and stuff like that because you can preserve you can basically inspect things without having to actually fully evaluate everything. I'm doing a really shit job of explaining this, but <laughs> it's a, 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 yeah, parsing is, a, is another rabbit hole for for applicative stuff. If you want to have a look at that, um, particularly all pass applicative is there headlining Haskell example for this that I've seen. Um, I, I, this is something I ran into in the JavaScript world because uh, uh, I was I was like, hey, what if we could do, I was doing like a talk about interpret, like um, uh, instructions and interpretation as a thing. And you can think of, um, you know, I/O uh, being instructions and, and the interpreter being Haskell itself, or you know, basically data structures that represent actions to take and stuff like that. And it's cool. And Fluch, you can kind of think of it that kind of way. It's a, it's a, it's a sort of lazy, lazy async promises. Well, not literally, you know, that kind of uh, lazy async um, computation kind of thing. And I was like, hey, maybe I can totally get a graph of how these different pieces fit together, so I can, you know, here's an instruction. The big async computation thing and then the interpretation is displaying it as a graph wow wouldn't that be cool and it's like okay cool i can do it for map and i can do it for a bunch of other op operations and chain god damn it and then it's like everything stops at chain because you need to evaluate it further to get further information out of it um the and then the bind the equivalent you know basically it's just the same name for the same thing there a different names for the same thing um and so it means you need to actually go and evaluate the contents of that to get the next step so I can actually figure out what the remaining structure of the, the future computation thing is. And it's like, oh, wait a minute, I've learned this before. Free monads, right. <laughs> so it's another thing where monad means you can't basically dive, dive into the guts of it, but applicative, so it's because you've still got this big structure you can look at is something you can dig into. I really need to like just link a blog post that I've found on this, but <laughs> just waving my hands is not working. Those are yeah, good I just, examples. Thanks. <laughs> I was just watching a video that uh, Edward Komet was giving on monoidal parsing. <laughs> it sounds really cool. Like it, he said, his motivation was to um, implement a programming language that's really dev tool friendly. Um, such that you can pick any point in the file from which to start parsing. <laughs> and then um, it will, like, if there's an error, then if there's a parsing error, then it'll just kind of skip as far as it can and then and, until it can start parsing again. So you can, like, parse uh, unparsable files otherwise. And it's a really interesting talk. I'll, I'll, let me link for that. 
I'll find a link for you. But yeah, I didn't even know you could do parsing with monoid. Like I thought that uh, there's either monad um, parsing, which was like the first thing that was discovered in Hassel, or later it was discovered like, oh, applicative parsing is even better. And I don't know, now, now there's monoid parsing. It's really, I'll find the video for you. Yeah, one thing I thought of right now is actually uh, the Flare UI stuff. That's completely applicative. You get to build a UI along the way of building up a data structure. And so like the side effect is that it builds up the UI. So maybe not practical everyday example, but it's still pretty cool nonetheless. Yeah, I think we're coming up on our uh, two-hour allotment here. <laughs> Scheduled two hours. Um, yeah, so I wonder if we should uh, call the meeting. Call the end. Sounds good. Maybe next time uh, we'll actually finish up that graph, open graph thing. <laughs> oh, the, the hack meetup next week or two weeks from now. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm afraid of... Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's it's that that code is a little scary. Not necessarily because of yes hood, but just the way everything is done already. So mm, yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, I think I'm probably done for today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for joining everybody. It's been really fun to chat. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for hosting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Later later all. Bye bye.